Hey everyone. I'm going to try not to make this video too long, but there are a lot of slides and uh, there's some really important information. So um, if you need to, press pause on the video, uh, jot down some notes, look something up. If you are not concerned or if you're not sure about something, go back and look at something or, or listen to something again if you need to. Okay, so this video is all about cell membranes, and cell membranes are enormously important to the functioning of cells. Uh, I like this GIF that's on this slide showing the fluidity of the lipid bilayer, the, the basic structure of all membranes inside of cells and surrounding cells is this lipid bilayer. And that chemical, the chemical that makes up that double layer of lipid molecules, if you have a pure sample of that chemical, it is liquid like an oil, like a bottle of corn oil at home. Uh, so it is fluid, it is dynamic, it is always changing. And then all the proteins that are plugged in there, tons of them with lots of different functions. Okay, so all cells surrounded by a plasma or cell membrane. And then in the case of some organisms, they also have a cell wall that is outside of the cell membrane. The cell wall providing some structural support and some extra protection for those cells. Uh, three really critical functions for cell membranes, but there are lots of others. Um, probably most important and most obvious is that the cell membrane is the gatekeeper for deciding what enters and what leaves a cell. And whether it's a single-celled organism or a multicellular organ or a single cell inside a multicellular organism, that function is hugely important. Um, you've heard maybe the expression, you are what you eat. Um, well, cells are what they take in and what they secrete or what they release. Um, that lipid bilayer, even though it is a fluid and it is just uh, a couple of molecules in, in layers thick, um, it provides a lot of protection for the cell. And that is because lots of molecules are not able to pass through that lipid bilayer. Some can, a few can, but most of the molecules dissolved in blood or body fluids can't pass through cell membrane easily. And lots of those proteins embedded in the cell uh, help to facilitate communication, uh, direct communication from cell to cell, and also communication across distances between cells in a multicellular organism. All right, there's another picture of the fluid mosaic model. Again, we have this double layer of these lipid molecules, and the lipid molecules have a part of them that is uh, a little bit polar, and so is um, attracted to water. And then the sort of tail pieces that you see on all of these lipid molecules, those are nonpolar and they repel water and this is why when you have this these chemicals in a watery environment they will form this double layer with the sort of water loving parts facing the outside surfaces where there would be water inside the cell and out and the water uh, avoiding or repelling parts of the molecules facing inside and it's this interior that's water hating or hydrophobic that is the barrier because not many molecules will pass through that hydrophobic interior of the lipid bilayer. So just a brief thing there about the cell walls. We're gonna look at some cells in class, some plant cells, and you'll be able to see their cell walls. Um, in some cases, the cells are very, very sort of regular and, and square boxy shaped. This is uh, 
an al a colonial algae here where the cells look very much alike one after another. And um, fungi have cell walls made of a slightly different substance than plants. Okay, we'll, we'll talk a lot about concentrations as we talk about substances moving into and out of cells. And there are different ways that scientists measure concentration. Uh, in chemistry classes, we measure concentration a lot using molarity, which is um, the scientific unit for uh, an amount of substance, a mole dissolved into a liter of solution. But lots of biological and medical applications use a mass over volume version of a concentration. So how many grams are dissolved in a liter or a milliliter or a deciliter? Um, in medicine, deciliter is a commonly used term. That's a tenth of a liter, 100 milliliters a, a little uh, a little more, or excuse me, a little less than a half a cup. Um, so you often see um, concentrations of substances in the blood given in milligrams per deciliter or micrograms or uh, even smaller units per deciliter. So when we talk about concentration, we're talking about how much stuff is dissolved into a certain volume of the uh, so solution medium or solvent and in the case of living things that solvent is water um, almost exclusively so when we talk about a solution being concentrated we would be talking about how much of a substance is dissolved in a certain amount of water how much salt is dissolved in, into some water how much sugar is dissolved in some water how much of a hormone is dissolved in the watery plasma of our blood All right, diffusion through cell membranes is really important. And diffusion is just a simple game of mathematics. Um, substances will tend to move from places where they are in high concentration to places where they are in lower concentration. And that is a mathematical reality. It's unavoidable. If you have particles that are moving around randomly and you've got a whole bunch of them in one area, the probability of one of those particles moving from an area where there are lots of them to an area where there are not many of them is high. Conversely, the probability of a molecule moving from a place where there are not very many and moving into a place where there are lots is much, much lower. It can happen, but the probability is lower. So the overall effect of this random motion of molecules is that substances will always tend to move from an area where they are in higher concentration to areas where they are in lower concentration. And that happens all by itself due to the random motions of molecules, uh, organisms and cells don't have to do any work uh, if diffusion will do the work for them. So looking at that across the cell membrane, if we have in this first part of the picture um, a lipid bilayer with water on both sides, on the upper side of the membrane here we see a lot of solute molecules, particles that are dissolved in the water. And initially, there are no, none of those solute particles on the other side of the membrane. So at first, the only direction that the solutes could move, if they can get past that lipid bilayer, is from the top to the bottom. But after not very long, there are enough of these particles on the bottom side where every once in a while, one of them might move back up. But overall, there would be more moving down from the top to the bottom than moving from the bottom to the top. And so the net effect is that the solute is um, moving from this area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. Eventually, 
you will have an equilibrium reached where the particles are still moving, still crossing the membrane in equal numbers as before, but now they are moving in equal numbers in both directions. So if you were measuring the concentration of substances on either side of the membrane, it wouldn't change over time. But in fact, the individual particles would be moving back and forth just as often as they had before. Important little bit of information on the bottom of this slide, two tiny molecules, oxygen and carbon dioxide, two tiny molecules that are important to living things, move across lipid bilayers, just like the particles shown in this diagram. They are able to pass through that hydrophobic interior, that water-hating interior of the membrane, because in fact, they are both kind of hydrophobic, both nonpolar molecules themselves, and because they're so tiny, as these lipid molecules are jiggling back and forth, it's a fluid, right? Little spaces can open up and those molecules can zip right through. Osmosis is the movement of water across the cell membrane. And it's, it's nothing but diffusion, just as we described in the previous slide. But because the movement of water into and out of cells is so important to living things, we are going to stick a special name on the diffusion of water across a membrane, and that is osmosis. Uh, there are some bad osmosis jokes. Um, if, you, if you ask me, I might be able to, I might be able to tell you one. Uh, so water molecules are also tiny, like oxygen and carbon dioxide. In fact, tinier than both oxygen and carbon dioxide. But water molecules are really polar, and so they would not be attracted by this hydrophobic interior, this nonpolar interior of the membrane. They would tend to be repelled by it. But because they're so tiny, and because there are so many water molecules bumping into a cell membrane on, you know, at any given moment, every once in a while, one of those water molecules will hit a gap and just keep going straight through. In addition to that very sort of strict diffusion of molecules through the plasma membrane, most cells have proteins that create channels through the lipid bilayer specifically for water to move through. And they call these proteins aquaporins. There are some other names for them, but it's basically a big uh, tube that selectively allows water molecules to go through um, that would facilitate the movement of water into or out of the cell. So some confusion often arises with osmosis because when we are talking about osmosis, we are talking about the movement of water and we also reference the concentration of the solution. So you see here in this one beaker, there is a selectively permeable membrane that is dividing the two sides of the beaker. On one side, we have a concentrated solution of sugar. You can see all the individual sugar molecules there. On the other side of the membrane, it's a dilute solution of sugar, not very much sugar dissolved in that side. The sugar molecules cannot pass through the membrane, and that would be true of cell membranes too. Um, we can absorb sugar molecules using special transport proteins, but they don't just pass through by diffusion. And so if we have this initial setup where we have lots of sugar on the left side, very little on the right side, another way to look at that is that we have lots more water in terms of the the percentage of the volume that's taken up by water molecules, a lot more water on the right side than the left side. And so what we will have happen is that the chances of a water molecule passing through the selectively permeable membrane 
the chances are greater that that's going to happen from the side where there is more water, less sugar, to the side where there is less water, more sugar. And again, that's just diffusion, but we have to be careful when we're talking about the concentration. Are we talking about the concentration of the stuff dissolved in the water, or are we talking about the concentration of the water itself? And I'll always try to be very explicit when I'm asking you about that. I just want you to understand how it works. All right, three terms that we use to describe the relative concentrations of solutions or the relative uh, sort of saltiness or wateriness of a solution. Um, hyper, hypo, and iso are three prefixes that mean above, below, and same. And a hypertonic solution is one that has more dissolved substance than the other solution you're comparing it with. Hypotonic is a solution that has less dissolved substance in it compared to whatever the other solution is you're comparing it with. So it's always in a comparison that you would use these terms. So back to this first, uh, this diagram that we just looked at, if we are referencing this side of the beaker where there's more sugar dissolved, that side is hypertonic to the side where there is less sugar dissolved. We could use the side that's less concentrated to be the reference point and say that that side is hypotonic compared to the other side. That's how we use those words. Here's a slide showing what happens when we take red blood cells, which look like sort of little red donuts that don't have the middle totally punched out. If we have red blood cells, um, our blood is a slightly salty solution. And so if we take a red blood cell that has cytoplasm that's slightly salty, just like the blood is, and we put it into a hypotonic medium, like some fresh water, then water will diffuse into the cell and that red blood cell can blow up like a balloon. And in fact, it can take on so much water that the cell membrane cannot take the added pressure and it can burst. Conversely, if we put that red blood cell into a hypertonic solution, one that has a lot more dissolved stuff in it, a saltier solution, then the opposite will happen. More water will leave the cell than enter the cell. And so over time, the cell would shrink up like a raisin. I think I'm going to have to stop there because this is already longer than any other video you've had. So I'm going to pause this now and we will talk about active transport and bulk transport when I make another video. I hope you were hanging in there with me for this long. <laughs> See you soon.